On today's show, I talked to John Cornicello, the assistant on Creative Live that everybody has come to know and love. And I talked to him about his story and how he ended up working for Creative Live. This is The Photography Junkie. How did, how did you get into photography? Yeah. Into photography. So um, back, I guess, around 71, 72, I was in high school, and a friend of mine worked in the camera department of a local department store and took me into buying a camera. And um, it was a Hanamex Practica with a 50-millimeter lens and started shooting stuff for the school newspaper and, and um, yearbook and things like that. Uh, the interesting thing is that this guy's name is Jose, Ir Jose Irizarry, and we found each other on Facebook a year or two ago. And just just two days ago, he found out he's coming out to a conference in Seattle in March, so it'll be good to get together. The person who got me started in all of wow. this. I, I think he lives in Puerto Rico now. Oh, that's that's going to be amazing to, to catch up after all that time. Yeah. I know, I know. So... Um, so basically, I did the high school thing, then I went off to college, and um, I thought I was going to go for electronic music and synthesizers, because that was a bigger interest there. That, uh, but I had a really great um, photography instructor there named Ed Scully. He was the editor of Camera 35 back at that time, and worked maybe modern photography and a couple other magazines. He was this old Navy guy who just really pushed us, um, you know, it was really really hard on everyone about everything uh, one of my favorite stories about him is someone once asked him in class why he never patted anyone on the back someone else yelled out from the back because he's too tired from kicking them in the <laughs> ass <laughs> um, but so he he instilled a lot of great knowledge I still have my notebooks from then and I'm actually thinking about approaching a couple of publishers about possibly writing a photography book um, sort of basics but some of the things that people don't talk about and or some of the things that come up on creative live and the questions that come up all the time and you know that maybe there's a more social we'll, we'll, well i always i always think to myself especially when it comes to things like this show um it's better to do it and for it to not do anything than to just not do anything mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so after college, I went into, I was in New Jersey at the time, went into New York, got a job at a catalog studio, uh, shooting catalog stuff two size on 4x5, 8x10, and 11x14 cameras with hot lights. Um, did that for about a year and a half. Uh, assist, I assisted for a year and then moved to another studio to become a, a photographer there and kept on with the large format stuff. Then got my own space and started doing some advertising work and the like um and then all of a sudden computers came out and i started building databases and you know, things like that to track clients and invoicing and things like that and after a while i was getting more calls for help with computers than i was getting photography jobs so i kind of started moving over into the computer world um also got into desktop publishing and typesetting and had a typesetting company for a while and that led me to hanging out with people at Adobe. And um, eventually I moved out to Seattle and to get a job with a place called Thunder Lizard Productions, who was doing PageMaker and Photoshop training conferences. I was there for a year and then Adobe and Aldis merged and there was an opening to do their forum stuff. So I jumped over to Adobe and, and I was there for about 20 years doing online forums and community So where was, where was the point where you first picked up? A digital camera. Presumably, you're shooting digital now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I actually enjoyed the switch to digital. Um, you know, for for a while, I my 35 millimeters were some Olympus point and shoots. Olympus, uh, I forgot what they call the cameras, but the, the ones yeah. that slide open and close. And I had a film one of those, and uh, I saw their digital came out. The first digital it was like a 0.9 megapixel around $500 I got one of those and it was the worst thing in the world um, it was just you know just these 
JPEGs with a lot of. Is that the one with the with the disc, the the floppy disk? No, that was Sony. The Mavic M, I think, was the floppy disk one. This one did use a memory card, or I think, or or just plugged into the computer. The memory card was built in, or something like that. But you know, it's just a fixed fixed lens, really low resolution. But then. A year or so after that, I saw another photo from an Olympus that a friend took, and it was a, a newer camera, had a zoom lens on it, and it was like the stylus that you know, the slide open and close one. And I got one of those in January of that year, which I might have been ninety nine or two thousand. I don't remember exactly which year. It was much better quality. And then Canon came out with the D thirty, the three megapixel camera, and.、Um, Some friends were having a party and said, "Why don't you do a, a photo booth for us at the party?" And then I think I didn't want to do it on film. I couldn't do it with the little Olympus, so I went and bought that that Canon D30, and I was hooked after the first couple of minutes with it.、Um, even for a three megapixel camera, I was able to make some nice size prints from it, and that got me into getting my lights out again and buying more lighting equipment, and really started me back into the hobby end of photography. So. Again, that must have been around 2000, 2001. I mean, we can look up when the when the D30 came out. Shortly after that, I got the D60 because that was a six megapixel camera.、Uh, from there, it was the 1D Mark II at eight pixels and a lot more money. <laughs> and after that, I,、uh, I got a 40D, then a 5D, 5D2, 5D3, and a 6D. I had a 7D in the in the mix there too, but I sold that one. Um, each time one of the new fives came out, I wasn't going to move up to the next one.、Uh, the first one, the five D two, came out, and a friend of mine came to me and said, "I had this underwater housing for a five D, and I can't, and I don't have a five D anymore. Will you sell me yours?" So he gave me a good price for it. I said, okay, that'll get me to the five D two, and I don't remember what drove me to to finally get the five D three, but it was good. So you pretty much stayed loyal to Canon ever since the beginning, then. Uh, actually, since the beginning, because after that Hanamex prep, well, since, back in, since the beginning of your, of your、so. digital journey, yeah, but I've been since the beginning of of the journey. I made a decision between Canon and Nikon at, at about 1973, and it was all because of where the button was on the top of the Nikon camera. It was the Nikon F Photomic. I actually have here. I bought one recently so I can show people that that the shutter button is on the back of the the top of the camera instead of the front and. Was, Was uncomfortable for my finger to to reach all the way back to press the button and to change film. You had to take the whole back off the camera. I got a Canon FTB back then and used that for many years. And then there was the A1, the AE1. I don't think I had an AE1. I think I went right to A1. And eventually they switched to the EOS line and an EOS A2. And then when the digitals came out, I already had Canon lenses.、Um, And I thought at the very beginning, I thought Canon was really far ahead、uh, because EOS line they had the bigger throat on the camera bodies, which was better for for getting light in and can have a larger rear exit pupil of the lens, th- things like that. I mean, Nikon's caught up since then, and I think they're all pretty similar. You know, does it? You go with, go with the camera that fits your hand and that you're comfortable with the menus on. Yeah,、um, I'm. That's why I go with the Sony stuff. It- It works for me.、Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, Sony's putting on、um, a two-day with DP review next week here in Seattle. So I guess I'll go and see a bunch of Sony.、Cameras. Yeah,、uh, I recently made the switch to mirrorless. L- literally、mm-hmm. sold my big camera, and I've ended up with.、Uh... Oop. <laughs> That、um, is base. The A six thousand is basically my my go to camera、uh-huh. these days. That's great. Yellow for a reason. How's how? Yeah, how's the ergonomics and the feel on it with the lens hanging out the front bigger than the camera? Well, you feel good. You naturally just just cup it with the, your other hand.、Uh, mm-hmm. It doesn't feel any any different.、Yeah. Uh, if I spin it around、nice. the other side. You can see the、mm-hmm. the telephoto wide switch for video,、yeah. and it just falls quite naturally where it should do. 
Mm-hmm. Big, bigger lenses, I, yeah, I suppose. Still used to having a big camera. It would feel a bit more unbalanced, but I rarely use anything other than this or the manual lenses from mm-hmm. Minolta and Leica and yeah yep from the mind of yep. Minolta well there was Sony Sony bought out Minolta so a lot of th- that was inherited right. do you ever miss the um, mm-hmm. the films like they... yeah well I'm glad they changed the hot shoe because Minolta used to have funky hot shoe and you, no one's flash or triggers worked on oh it's it's still proprietary as well and I see uh huh. But yeah. you could put a normal flash or a pocket wizard or radio popper on it. We couldn't on the OEN. Yeah, I yeah, I, I just I, even put it on. I hated that. Huh. So yellow. What's the reason? Because it makes people ask the question. If somebody uh-huh. asks the yeah, well, I guess somebody asks the question, why have I got a yellow camera? Then I can turn that into them walking away with a business card. Yeah, they have a pink pocket wizard on my camera. I have a yellow um, GoPro as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. I, I want to be noticed. I'm not a stealth photographer usually. I want people to notice and interact if, with me. If people have so have something unusual that they can spot, say a yellow camera, then it gives them permission to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And. So yeah, since the digital world, they've gone all, all canon. Do you ever, do you ever miss the old analog days? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I, 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 yes, and yes. I mean, I still have a uh, five by seven Deardorff field camera, you know, wooden folding camera. Uh, we'd love to pull a right type fifty five for that, you know. So I'm waiting to. There's the fifty project, and there's another company that's trying to build out some Polaroid 55 type materials so that I you know I would love to work with the the 4x5 camera again you know if we find some way to adapt an affordable digital back to the to the wooden field camera that would be great like like a giant affordable camera (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean that's started scanning backs for the 4x5s you know if you can get a big CMOS center and the um, sensor on the back that would be great though yeah I, I do miss working large format stuff but shooting 35 millimeter size, um, I'm all, all for the digital. I mean, I, I think the quality's better. I can make it look somewhat film if I want to destroy some pixels and <laughs> things like that. But you know, I um, and I and I shot chromes, you know, as as a studio photographer with the four by five and the like. So I was used to getting everything as close as possible in the camera, you know exposing for the highlights letting the shadows fall where they may and that's pretty much the way we digital works you know i think portrait photographers that worked on negative films we had we had the lab do a lot of the color balancing and the exposure corrections and the like you know probably had a tougher time see i i am up to 10 cameras now and only three of them are digital <laughs> I mean, I've got a, a cabinet full of old film cameras going back to brownies. Uh, there's a Mami C330, I think, in there. Um, some 1940s Russian cameras, just different things I've picked up over the years. I still have my film cameras. I just don't some. I have like three or four cans, you know, the old Kodak cans. Uh, let's see something. <laughs> Where are we? There we are. My calendar popped up. They were about to start. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have a, a box of 3M 640T film and a couple other things. Every once in a while, I put them out, put them on a, on a tabletop and take a photograph in the morning and I shot film time. <laughs> See, I, I actually go out and I shoot it and I process it and I scan it and it then goes into Lightroom. <laughs> oh, that's great. Nice. Yeah, just... You know, most of my stuff now is portraits and headshots. I mean, it's probably 80% corporate headshots. So it's almost all digitally. The delivery is digital. You know, I don't have to print anything, even though I did recently get a printer. So my few of my cameras are over on the side. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is that a BS6? It's a uh, Mamiya 6.7. Mamiya RB? 
Yeah, an yeah. RB67 uh, okay. RZ. And there's also uh, a Bronco Clunk as well, Clunk. ETR. Uh, uh -huh. There's a okay. Zenit 35mm, which I had converted to a pinhole camera. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a Kodak and there's a Minolta on that on that shelf. Nice. Nice. I, I went from digital to film. Okay. I know a few people have tried that and, you know, really enjoy it. I just... I think I think it's good for people to totally at least do for a year. What I like about film cameras is you can open the back, take the lens, and look through it and see how the shutter works, see how the aperture works, and things like that. And that's one of the things. If I do this book, really, you know, I want to show you. Here's what's happening in in your camera that you can't see anymore. You know, in the old days, we just take things apart and, and see how it works. You know, what is an f-stop? You know, what. What do we mean by a by a focal plane shutter and and things like that? So, got to write up that book proposal and get it out. To I think I think you should. I think I, I'd certainly be happy to read it. Well, thanks. Uh, you've got uh, Chris Marquard on Tips from the Top Floor, and um, he's coming out with a <laughs> book all on film as well. So I'm just waiting for that one to come out in mm -hmm. English. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. Um, lost my train of thought, though. <laughs> That's okay. That's, that's okay. Uh, I think talked a little bit about how I got involved with Creative Live yeah, yeah. before we start um, recording here. Um, so, basically, it was starting up. It's a startup here in Seattle, and they invited people to come to some Photoshop classes that they were doing live to sit in on, and I went to a few of those, and then they moved into a bigger space, and they did these classes with Zach Arias and um, what's her name? Um, Jasmine Starr. Uh, and I saw them and I saw, you know, these, these look like a good way to learn and a good way to teach, but um, you know, there's no one helping them out really. And I wasn't sure, you know, if they, they needed assistance or anything like that. So I used to stop in, in their studio once a month and tell them they needed me to come in. Cause I, you know, I can work with the photographers and help them out and make them look good. And when Jeremy Cowart was coming in to do his class on um, experimental portraiture and talk about uh, the help portrait project, they said, okay, come on in for this class. And um, Jeremy and I hit it off really well. And, People watched us and thought we'd been friends for years. We'd only known each other for about two or three hours when we went on live. And um, after that, Creative Live said, "Okay, you're you're in, and we'll pay you to come in and, and assist." So, uh, so is, but, is that actually a full time here. thing for you, or or do you balance it with your no, photography it's, work? It's, 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 it's freelance. I mean, it de depends on the classes they're doing. Uh, like, I don't go in for the wedding classes and the small flash stuff. You know, it's usually people are doing studio things. They'll be in there for or for photo weeks. So maybe it's three or four days a month that I'm that I stop in there. Um, their studio is just almost exactly three miles from my house, and there's a bus that stops in front of my house in front of their studio. So I, it's a, it's an easy thing to go down and help them out, and and they have good lunches. Yeah, I I do see quite often the um the pictures of the lunches pop up in my feed. Uh huh. So um, you managed to get yourself a bit of a reputation as the ultimate studio accessory. Yes, yeah, you know, because I can usually anticipate what they're what they're going and you know, with things. And you know, a couple of people I work with, uh, Tony Corbell calls me a mind reader. You know, every time he says, "Well, want to go in my bag and get the?" Oh, I already have it for you. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I. I, I I mean, I, I know stuff pretty well, and I know what they're going to be teaching, and I can often anticipate what they're going to need. Or sometimes, yeah, I, I don't like to say it out loud, but sometimes they're, you know, I, I feel they need to say something about something that's not going there. So I'll put that, pull that piece of equipment out and hold it in front of them, and go talk about this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times I can anticipate the questions that are going to come from the, the studio audience too. I mean, because I don't have the pressure on me. You know, they've got their, their keynote and they're trying to follow along and they're to remember all these things want to want to touch on. And I don't have any of that to, to, you know, hold me back so I can kind of watch the students in the in the classroom 
and anticipate what the students online are going to say. And, you know, and as I say, I'm, I'm there to make them look good. And usually most times it works. We've always got this, this very sort of calm demeanor about you. Um, is there anywhere where that actually comes mm-hmm. from or, or, or are you just naturally very chill? Uh, it comes from moving to Seattle. Come. No, it, it comes from moving to Seattle from New York. <laughs> You know, if I if I fly back to New York and get off the plane, I could be right back into the the whole agitated and angry at the world thing. You know, then I come to Seattle on the mountains and forest. You know, and just everyone's chill. It's a hippie land out so here. Seattle's just been a, a a giant holiday by comparison. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. That's a good way of putting it. So, yeah, and I, as I said, the pressure on me that the instructor has. You know, I, I've taught a couple of classes on Native Live, and it's it's a lot different there. Uh, I did this fireworks one a few years ago. That was um, basically Craig Watson, the founder of Native Live, said, "You know, we need to do a class on fireworks on Fourth of July." And I said, "Oh, I can do that. Oh, give me ten minutes on." He said, "Can you stretch it out to an hour?" And I said, "I don't know. I'll try." But you know, I can teach you everything you need to know about fireworks in ten. I do. You, I do actually remember we managed to do it because you it. it. If I remember rightly, what's that? I, 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 do, hear you. I do remember watching that as well. Um, I think you blogged it as well. No, it's still available because it was a free class. Uh, it should be on YouTube too. So it's I don't know if it's still on the Creative Live site, but it's definitely still on YouTube. I'll, I'll link that in the studio in the studio notes in the show notes. So yeah, yeah, great. Little, if you can't find it, let me know. Yeah, I did a couple other freebies on Creative Live. I did one on, you know, my favorite lighting modifier, which at the time was the Fotex Off Lighter 2. And I did some things with DP Review there. So there's, I've got a few free classes available on Creative Live that people can So what's, what's the chair project? Uh, the chair project. Uh, a little over a year ago, uh, my wife and I were at a garage sale at another studio here in Seattle. And there was this chair there that they said, oh, they wanted $5 for it. My wife really liked it. And we brought it home and it just kind of sat here. One day I just put it on a set, took a self-portrait just to see what it looked like. And it seemed okay. And a friend was coming over later that afternoon and I had her sit in the chair and did a picture of her. My mom was over a day or so later, did a picture of her. And I realized, hey, I can keep this thing going. So uh, there's, you know, there's, there's no super connection to the chair or anything but it's fun to just get people sit down and be themselves and we, we do a quick portrait and about five months ago i started inviting instructors that i was working with the creative live i think Lindsay adler was the first one i had come over and after that brooke shaden was dressing through seattle and i had her stop in peter hurley was in last week uh tony corbell andrew scrivani was in a couple of days ago for for another, um, not, no, he wasn't here at Creative Live. He was just in Seattle for another project, and so I just say, "Come on over, and you know, you'll get a bunch of photographers looking forward to coming over." And we have fun, and it's an honor for both of I, us. I could see that turn that into a photo book or something, some some project. Yeah, to, yeah. To frame everybody in. Yeah, I don't know. Right, right. So yeah, something will come of it. Some it's some year. It would just be a giant album of like 200 pages or something. Right. Pages, yep. Yeah, Ben Wilmore and his wife Karen were in. That's right, there's more photographers in there, so. And a few local photographers. It'll have to be a, a funky name or... Yeah, I'll come up with something. So what's... What, if you want to name it. <laughs> what's in the pipeline for for John Cornicello? Is it Cornicello or Con... Con... Uh, Cornicello. Cornicello, yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, I think it was Cornicello when I went to um, kindergarten and the teacher said, no, it's Italian, it's Cornicello. You know, Cornicello. And so it's so that's the way it is. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the, the proper proper pronunciation. In the channel for me, uh, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I have left my corporate job just a little over a year ago. It was in May of uh, 2014 going into these corporate headshots and portrait stuff and we have this line called celebrate you which is borders on boudoir but not really boudoir it's just we've had people from all walks of life and ages you know 
celebrate your accomplishments and your obsessions. Um, one of our clients was someone who had run like 40 marathons in, in 50 weeks and she just brought all her medals and big numbers and things like that and just did some photos with them. Uh, um, yeah, a few different you know, cancer survivor, a few things like that. So just celebrate you, you know. It's, it sounds like a good thing to... Make it what you want it to be. That's like something that would become popular as from a business point of view. I hope so. I'm just not a really good marketer. I'm working with my wife's working in the business now too. She has an accounting and financial back. So she takes care of that side of things, the billing and the business and the tax and the like, but we, we need to work on the promotion side and get ourselves out there. Um, yeah. I, I, I think the whole pricing thing, you know, I, I struggle through the same thing. The students at creative live do, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's gone quite hard for the uh, creative industry as a whole in recent years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you think it's... Yeah, I mean, it's not recent years. It's, I, I don't know. I mean, we get people that complain that everyone has a camera, uh, but, but they don't have the lights. They don't have the posing things and, and the like. And actually, I can... There's a book called... Fred Archer on portraiture that came out in the 1940s and like on page 30 of that book he, he starts talking about how the guys pull off at the war and all the women in America are buying cameras and everyone has a little little 35 millimeter camera now and they're all hanging a shingle out and becoming photographers and everyone's a photographer and this book was written like I said in 1943 so it's it's, it's you know it's the same it's, there's always some there's always people coming in and you know, you just got to stand out above the crowd. It rises. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of the teaching thing, too, is as they say, you know, um, a rising tide raises all boats, you know, so the more I, I'm, I'll share anything with people, you know, I'm always trying to help people out. You know, uh, it seemed like in the 60s, 70s, photographers weren't as open about sharing things they did and the like. Uh, but I think now in the internet age everyone's sharing a lot i think more. you still get a few of the the old guard that don't want to share anything what they know is is guarded like <laughs> more more than golem's ring yeah so you now totally opposite you know I'll, I'll try to answer any question if i don't have an answer i'll try to make one up <laughs> for you no actually i actually i'm not a, i'm not afraid to say i don't know the answer to something you know, let's let's go figure it out. Uh, and and a lot of times, if you know, I get a I just did this blog post on shutter speed and flash thing because everyone at Creative Lives, said, you know, why does the shutter speed not matter when you're shooting flash? And you know, someone on a friend on Facebook from Albania wrote to me asking about it. Seemed really confused about it, so I just wrote this blog post and took pictures of a fan spinning at different shutter speeds. And showed that you know at 125th at of a second and a 15th of a sec, the flash the same. You know, as you're in a dark studio, the, the shutter speed isn't con controlling anything except the ambient light. There's no ambient light. The shutter can be open for hours. You know, there's no exposure until that flash goes off, and it's just that brief. Thing. Yeah, I like I like combining how point uh, people who... so uh, the late late flash uh, along with light painting and things like that. Yeah. To, to lock my subject yeah. in. And... Yeah, yeah. Great. Try to get, uh, once you understand that the flash exposure is a double exposure happening at once, you know, you have this ambient thing that you can control with shutter speed and by moving your camera, and you have this other exposure that's going to be stop action with the flash and the aperture. And then once you realize it's a double exposure and it's all happening and it's easy to control, you can have yeah. fun with it. Drag that shutter and spin the camera around. Well, we are approaching 30 minutes so where can people find you okay uh my website is cornicello.com c-o-r-n-i-c-e-l-l-o and i'm also on instagram at cornicello photo um i think it's cornicello twitter i'm not a big twitter person uh i'll just go on there once in a while and look at things there's just too much going by for me to to pay attention on this. So Instagram and Facebook are my big ones. Um, you can find me. Either of those I'll easily. put those in the show notes so that people can come sure. in. 
So you, for those two people out there that don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's pretty, pretty wild to realize that, you know, I, um, I can go different places and people will stop and know me. Um, it didn't happen in Cuba to me, but it did to Kenna from Creative Live. She was walking the street, through the streets in Cuba and someone came up to her and recognized her as the <laughs> person from Creative Live and started talking to her about it. Is, it must be strange so that when, was, that, when that happened. happened. Yeah, I mean, even before Creative Live, you know, the Seattle folks knew me. I'd be in a grocery store and people would come up to me and start talking to me about something. And, you know, and realize, oh, you don't know who I am. I, I know you. I've seen you teach things and, <laughs> and the like. So it's it's always it's always fun. Um, Thank you for coming on the show on that one. Sure. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate your asking. That was, that was great. <laughs>